All right, so I did send out an uh, email about the office hours today, and I know some of you cannot make it uh, and requested uh, for an ad uh, other times. And I, definitely I can um, find a, a couple of other time slots for office hours. Okay, so, yeah. um, I'll look up. Um, I'm pretty sure tomorrow is possible, uh, sometime in the afternoon or, or even, yeah, definitely in the afternoon I can make it. Okay, so. uh, yeah, any other questions? or Yeah. You, had a, you can make it uh, today. Oh, I see. Okay, uh, that's fine. I'll, I'll uh, uh, also uh, weekends work. I mean, I'm not going to force you, but I'll I can send out an email that uh, I'll be around in campus around this time if you want to come by. So yeah. Um, okay. So. Uh, uh, what we were uh, uh, discussing it was the end of the class uh, uh, on on Tuesday was uh, uh, essentially we had kind of a snapshot of various uh, 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 tools that we use to to uh, track uh, crystal growth uh, growth of compound semiconductors uh, or all kinds of semiconductors as a matter of fact and uh, uh, so in particular we were looking at uh, this particular uh, growth technique uh, which is physical uh, vapor deposition, uh, be it uh, molecular beam epitaxy, or uh, it can go in many ways, sputtering, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, this pulse laser deposition, and all kinds of, so it's essentially uh, uh, growth of these crystals when you do not uh, require a, a uh, you know, a, a chemical reaction in the sense that you always have a chemical reaction. It's just you do not have elements that uh, are other than what you want to grow. You know, if you're trying to grow uh, gallium uh, arsenide, then you have gallium atoms and arsenic atoms. You know? So, and and uh, uh, the other end of the spectrum, which we'll discuss in in reasonable detail uh, in the last couple, uh, two or three weeks uh, uh, of the course. Uh, um, is uh, actually we are kind of nearing the end, end as well, but uh, it's chemical vapor deposition where you actually depend upon a chemical reaction uh, between uh, a bigger molecule that has gallium as one of its constituents uh, to chemically react with something else, with, with the ammonia which has three hydrogen atoms with a nitrogen, and then the end product of this is gallium and nitrogen may form a chemical bond and everything else has to leave. You know? so, so that would be a chemical uh, vapor deposition technique, and these were uh, physical vapor deposition techniques. And I think the distinction sometimes is very clear. Sometimes it may not. You know, physical vapor deposition, deposition could use a little bit of chemi uh, chemistry as well. Okay, so so it depends on what you need for the growth. So, uh, so uh, one of the primary reasons I started talking about is because we are talking about diffraction techniques and such. And uh, in physical vapor deposition, uh, uh, the diffraction really. Uh, diffraction techniques uh, really tell you the structure of the crystal as you are growing. You know, as you are growing the crystal layer by layer, you can do uh, electron beam diffraction uh, depending upon the source. Uh, if you have a very powerful X-ray source, you can do, uh, you know, from a synchrotron source or something like that. You can do X-ray as you are growing the material. So then you can detect the nature of the chemical bonds, the crystal structure, the lattice as you're growing, and that's kind of very useful as well. Uh, and uh, we talked a bit about uh, uh, the sources, how, how you essentially get fluxes of uh, atoms. Uh, uh, essentially, we talked about thermal sources uh, in cases where you, uh, and thermal sources have these sort of uh, patterns. You know, if you heat uh, uh, molten, uh, very clean, but molten aluminum or gallium inside a crucible, uh, depending upon where your substrate sits, it can have various patterns and all that, right? Depending upon the distance and angle and such. Uh, we didn't discuss that in great detail, but uh, uh, at least uh, I wanted to start pointing out. Uh, similarly, sometimes you use this, uh, uh, what would be typically called as cracker or cells, or, uh, uh, you know, essentially if you want to filter out uh, a heavier molecular species, uh, for example, arsenic, if you start with arsenic, and you have arsenic four, you know, tetramers and dimers and then monomers, which is a single arsenic atom. If you have this sort of baffles or you heat them up, then essentially uh, you start cracking the, the, the bigger molecules into smaller elements which you need for the growth. So, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, so the, uh, so just pictorially it's shown that a bigger molecule lands because of the heat, it dissociates on the surface and then goes out as a smaller molecule.
of the same species. You know, so, uh, and uh, sometimes if you uh, cannot get enough flux out of a molecule, you are using these E-beam sources, electron beam. Right? And then we talked about various detection schemes if you want to detect how much of a flux is coming out here in terms of gallium atoms or aluminum or indium or any, any flux that you want to measure. Uh, some techniques use uh, the resonance of piezoelectric layers like quartz, right, and you just measure the thickness. They don't tell you what atoms are landing on it, just how much has deposited and so on. And then you can have ionization gauges uh, and then you have mass spectrometers that actually tell you what atoms as well as the flux. Okay, so, so that's kind of nice. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and then uh, the reason I started talking about this is because uh, we had talked about diffraction and uh, as one of the, uh, or scattering experiments as one of the most uh, uh, you know, uh, important tools to understand crystal structure and, and how good are the quality of a crystal defect densities, size of crystals, all that stuff can be achieved from here. And, uh, you know, because of ultra high vacuum environment, for example, during the growth, we discussed that if you shoot electron beams and you bounce off a substrate, then obviously you can now get electron diffraction patterns as you grow. And that's kind of really neat because you can detect as you are growing whether your surface is smooth, what is the crystal structure, uh, and, and all kinds of other things like that. So you can kind of get a Fourier transform of the surface uh, as you are growing the crystal, right? So then that's kind of very useful. Right? So, so to track, and you can take this image, do some image processing and feedback and say that, well, my surface is roughening because I'm going there, I want more like this. So you can change the temperature or the fluxes or something like that with feedback to go back to, to where you want to be, you know, so, so with, with, with constant feedback. So that's used uh, in industry actually for, uh, as well for, for uh, uh, you know, keeping track of uh, uh, crystal growth. And the other very important tool I mentioned that is used is uh, because of, uh, uh, as you start growing, uh, a very smooth surface will very intense uh, diffraction spots. And as you go to a rougher surface, you start getting dimmer, right? And then again, uh, so if you complete one monolayer of growth and then again go back to smooth surfaces, so intensity starts oscillating between bright and dim, and so from intensity oscillations, you can uh, count how many layers you have grown and things like this. It's very precise precision uh, control over the growth, uh, uh, over how much you want to grow as well. Okay, so. So uh, these are uh, obviously extremely useful tools, uh, and uh, and uh, we will uh, now I'll start mixing up uh, the growth and the techniques that we use for uh, tracking them because they are kind of um, dependent on on each other. Uh, one of the things I had mentioned earlier was uh, you know uh, it's uh, the question you, you might have asked. I'm just repeating this that it, because at any temperature the crystal is vibrating and there. In reality, the locations of the atoms are not exactly at periodic lattice, but there's sm small changes. That should, in principle, if you think, uh, initially you might think that it might wash out the entire diffraction pattern, but the answer is really it does not. It was shown, uh, it's called the debye waller factor, that it just lowers the intensity. It, it makes it a little more diffuse, but it does not wash out the main pattern. Okay? And that's actually a very important uh, uh, result uh, without which we obviously won't be able to use uh, diffraction patterns as a diagnostic tool. Uh, at the same time, it has actually kind of very interesting consequences. I had mentioned I'll, I'll probably ask you as uh, one of the problem, I assign you as one of the problems because uh, uh, it turns out that if you take a 2D crystal uh, and uh, uh, a t instead of a three-dimensional crystal, if you have a two-dimensional crystal and uh, uh, you Basically, what you can show is 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 that the vibrations, lattice vibrations, make the crystal uh, a two D crystal thermodynamically unstable. You know, so so it, it's a very interesting result. Uh, and uh, uh, there's actually a theorem based on the debye waller factor, but actually derived by uh, uh, David Mermin and others, the Mermin Wagner theorem, which says that a two D crystal intrinsically should be thermodynamically unstable, but you can stabilize it by many other means, which is obviously the reason you have you know, uh, graphene and all that are, are okay. You know, I mean, it's, it's not like it's completely unstable, uh, but it, it has a tendency to form ripples and all that uh, instead of being very flat because of this instability and things like that. So I'm just mentioning this. I've not covered that in class in detail, but I, I might uh, uh, add that into this assigned problem that I'm seeing, this instability problem. Okay. So today what we are going to do is, is discuss in quite more detail uh, what happens after these atoms land on the surface and 
how do they form the chemical bonds and what is the structure of the chemical bonds and, and, and rather uh, so, so the, 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 in a way, the, uh, the science of, of, of uh, the actual f uh, formation of the crystal. So, so that's, that's what we're going to look at uh, after stuff lands on the surface and what happens. Okay, so yeah. so I will, I'll first start with, again, a more a general idea, which is uh, rather pervasive. And you, if you have taken courses on thermodynamics and, or related to the, uh, such courses, you have seen it probably very often. But we will now look at it from the point of view of uh, growth of Compound semiconductors and materials. Okay. So uh, what we will start with is, is uh, again, the process of growth is is really, uh, uh, as you can see in a physical vapor deposition picture, you, the system may be very complex, etc. But the actual physical process which is leading to growth is actually very simple. There are very few things to control, and within those windows, uh, within you have very few knobs to turn, and within that you have to figure out at, under what conditions. I can grow a good, you know, high-quality crystal that I want, right? So, so it's, it's not really a very large window. And in fact, what we'll see uh, as we discuss this further is uh, uh, the windows uh, of growth are typically very sharp and very unforgiving. If you go too far, you'll screw up really badly. You know? so, so it's very sharp and very unforgiving in some sense. So the larger is the window, you know, the easier is that material to grow. You know, that, that's what you can, the, because then you can, uh, be a little bit off and still get very high quality and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and, and, the re and, and all these words, I think if you kind of start thinking, these are really coming from uh, the two uh, joint aspects of basically thermodynamics and from kinetics. You know. So many of the growth techniques, you are pulling it far out of equilibrium. But far out of equilibrium, as you know, everything is under equilibrium considering the size of the box you put it inside, right? I mean, if a small window may be far out of equilibrium, but the bigger window is actually still in equilibrium and things like that. So it depends on what is the window you're looking at, right? So what, we're going to, what I'm going to do is first look at some examples of growth uh, under physical vapor deposition, under the garb of physical de vapor deposition, and then start looking at the energy scales and then develop ideas. Uh, in fact, today, by the end of the class, what I want to do is answer one question, which is a very important question in the growth, is uh, let's say you want to grow an alloy layer, right? Uh, indium gallium arsenide, let's say, or indium gallium nitride. Now, that's a very interesting problem because you're mixing two kinds, right? You're mixing two binary semi, or you're going to grow silicon germanium, you know, silicon germanium alloy. Uh, now, that system will try to grow uh, there are many ways for it to you know end up right it can go be all silicon with little clusters of germanium right or it can be all you know uh, so so it can completely phase separate that means in, or it can grow you know in within any, any microscopic small window of say 10 lattice constants you cannot tell them apart i mean they're mixed up very you know nicely and uniformly so that this is a phase transition problem and we're going to actually try to solve that and show how what is the general means of explaining when can you grow a uniform alloy, a random alloy, compared to a compositionally fluctuated alloy or completely phase separated alloy. You know. We'll see that there can be, basically for a binary system, you again maybe have seen this, but in a binary system you can have basically it's kind of three situations, right? Uh, we'll look at that. Okay, so. So let's start with uh, getting a feel for what kind of, uh, uh, you know, what, what, what are the controls you typically have during crystal growth. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm, at this stage, I'm talking about physical evaporation, not about chemical yet. Okay, so, uh, but the, the ideas are not very different. Okay, so, so in physical vapor, vapor deposition, for example, let's say you're growing gallium uh, arsenide. Oh, let's start with say, gallium nitride. It's a relatively newer material. So uh, in, in gallium nitride growth, uh, uh, so, so what you will be doing is basically um, you, you have a gallium source and you will be heating up the, as we discussed last time, you have a diffusion cell or evaporator. You heat it up typically to about 1,000 degrees Celsius. And at 1,000 degrees Celsius, your flux of gallium atoms that reach the substrate, uh, and you know, when the atoms hit the substrate, uh, the effective pressure, you know, force per unit area, is of the order of uh, 10 to the power minus 7. Uh, uh, so, so let me just uh, sketch this first. Uh, so, so you have a gallium source. Uh, this is a schematic picture. And then uh, remember, because of the high vacuum, there's nothing to collide. They go ballistically. Okay? And then your substrate is sitting here. 
Uh, and, and what I'm saying is as the atoms impinge on the, surf on, on the surface of the substrate, uh, could be silicon, could be gallium nitride, if you're doing you know, homoepitaxy, it could be gallium nitride, or it could be any substrate you're uh, looking at. Okay? Uh, and, uh, and, and the atoms basically hit the surface. Uh, and uh, if you look at the pressure per unit, uh, or rather the force per unit area, uh, that's the pressure. I'm saying the pressure would be off the order of 10 to the power minus 7 a tor, uh, and I think can convert into pascals and all that. So th roughly this order of magnitude. Yeah. And most uh, crystal growth uh, by MB will be like that. You grow gallium arsenide or any uh, indium phosphide or any of these other uh, three fives I mentioned. It will be of that order. You know, so. And the cell temperatures uh, of the gallium cell temperature would be off the order of 950 to 1000 depends on many things. As you see, if, you subs if your MB system is bigger and this is farther away, you may need a little higher temperature here to have the same flux there and, and, and things like that. Okay, so, uh, and then I think we know that the flux of gallium would go as some constant times e to the power minus activation energy over K times, you know, Boltzmann constant times this temperature. You know, so it's, it's a fusion process and it's going to be exponential like that. Uh, okay, so, uh, uh, so that is typically the flux rate and I, I think you also understand that as the atoms land here, uh, uh, the other thing you control very carefully and this is, these are the controls I'm, I'm kind of trying to uh, fig, uh, say. So, so inside this uh, substrate is sitting on something which has a, another coil and it's a heater. Uh, so essentially this heater is controlling the temperature of the substrate. Right. At, at a certain, you keep the substrate at a certain temperature. Right? So, so you heat it up typically, uh, and you, uh, and the substrate temperature uh, depends on the semiconductor. Gallium arsenide maybe closer to 500 Celsius. Uh, gallium nitride maybe about 700 C. Depends. You know? So it depends on which material you're looking at. But the general trend is if your chemical bonds are stronger, meaning bond energy is larger, then you need to be at a higher temperature. Right. And then that I think is very, ho hopefully is clear because uh, you want the atoms to diffuse on the surface and spread out smoothly because you're growing a smooth, you want to grow a smooth layered surface. And uh, intuitively you can see at least, uh, uh, very intuitively, the higher the temperature the easier it will be for it to spread, you know, maybe. You can think if, yeah, if you have very low temperature you have a chunk of metal but if you heat it it melts and wets the surface. So all these energies are, are, are going to play a big role and this is, one way to control it, you know, so the temperature of the substrate. This is a very important control parameter, the temperature of the substrate, the, uh, uh, the flux. But flux uh, is, is actually is, is the important parameter, but I think what, the way you're controlling the flux here is by controlling the cell temperature. So that's what you're really controlling, but uh, uh, it, this is your norm that, that you can change. Right? And then remember, this is an exponential norm, right? So you're... Uh, Okay, so, uh, uh, so, so this is the uh, uh, second uh, control. And I would say that uh, really uh, the flux of the elements that you are uh, trying to grow, and then if you're growing gallium nitride, there'll be also a similar thing about a nitrogen, you know, nitrogen gas coming in, there'll be a certain flux here, right? So flux of the sources or the pressure, if you want to say the pressure of nitrogen, or arsenic if you have a gallium arsenide growth, or phosphorus if you have gallium phosphide growth, whichever, right? So the, uh, basically these, these are really, in a physical vapor deposition, these are really your control elements and, and uh, uh, you are really not controlling much, anything else other than these things. It's very few, very few, and you have to find out within this, so you can imagine, essentially each of them is an axis, you know, mathematically if you want to make a plot, each of these is the axis, you know, temperature of the substrate, let's sketch it out, okay. temperature of the substrate, then maybe, uh, so, so if I, you know, just from this picture, it's that three-dimensional, uh, uh, you know, pressure of gallium, pressure of, say, arsenic, right? It's a 3D space, right? And what I was trying to say earlier is within this 3D space, there is a little window somewhere where you'll get very good quality growth, and outside it, it'll, it'll, it'll be phase separated, it'll be blobs of gallium and arsenic or something like that. So, so really, that's what we are after, right? And, and the question is, how do you find that? Right? I mean, once you locate that, then obviously you can zone in and start growing in that region, and, you know, and it's very repeatable after that, right? So, 
Uh, again, I mean, didn't say anything new yet, uh, nothing science-wise, but at least uh, uh, it's, it hopefully gives you a fair idea of what are the parameters that you can control. Yeah. The other parameter you can actually control is, yes, your pressure could be that, but uh, in physical vapor deposition and also in CVD, uh, you have also uh, a shutter. Uh, in the gallium cell may be hot, but the shutter can go back and forth, right? And so it can modulate the beam molecular beam you can have so you have time as another axis for you you're saying, so, so time so meaning uh, uh, you know the shutter can open and then let through so uh, I would say that you know uh, time is another control you know, so, so sometimes you do modulated beam epitaxy or uh, uh, you, you don't have a continuous stream of atoms going but you basically uh, pulse it you know? uh, so so that's another axis that you can play with, and actually it's used quite often for some growths. So uh, depends on what you're trying to grow. Uh, uh, so so uh, I'll give you a, a short example of, uh, uh, you know, since we're talking about specific cases here, uh, if you look at uh, uh, gallium arsenide, for example, you can right away see that if I am just growing a binary you know, a, a binary semiconductor or a 3-5 semiconductor, or if you're growing silicon germanium for that matter, right? silicon germanium, right? Uh, so you, uh, that's also grown typically by MB, or germanium tin. Actually, there was a read image here showing, you know, this is the growth of uh, germanium tin alloys. Currently, this is being actually quite uh, intensely, uh, you know, investigated now because germanium is a small band gap, but people are trying People have been trying for the last 60 years to get light out of germanium. It's an indirect band gap semiconductor, but it's very close to being direct. It's a strain. And now adding tin, they can shrink the band gap. And by growing a few quantum wells of germanium tin, it starts looking like one can, one can start getting a reasonable amount of light out. And it has other inter interesting things. It has tunneling field effect transistor sort of applications and such. But you know, I, I'm saying, so you can have germanium and tin, silicon and germanium, or gallium and arsenic, and all these are. Uh, germanium tin is an alloy. Gallium arsenide is really not an alloy, right? In the, in the way we want it. You know, it's, it's a binary semiconductor, right? Right? Does that make sense? It's not like here I have more arsenic, there I have less. No, it's every other atom is gallium, and the next one is arsenic. Right? So, so that's. So uh, let's look at gallium arsenic. Typically, the growth of gallium arsenic you can right away see. So there is an axis of uh, arsenic and axis of gallium. Let's say this is the flux of gallium. Uh, let's call it flux instead of pressure, and this flux of arsenic. And I see you can see that you know this this whole 2D plane of. Uh, uh, flux of arsenic uh, so you can kind of draw our axis through here and uh, you know any any if you're sitting here your your gallium or group three this is the language you will hear group three this is group five right from periodic table three five three five semiconductor right compound so uh, if you are here your three to three five ratio is more than one right if you are you know in, in, above there right it's very clear right so you can, that's that's the uh, uh, thing that you can actually now uh, say that uh, what is the three five ratio? That's typically what people will be asking when you're growing. What's the three five ratio? Right? Uh, and if you're here, your your uh, group five is much higher than group three. Uh, and uh, as an example, gallium arsenide and most other three most three fives except the nitrides actually. Uh, so uh, most of them are grown under extremely uh, or let me write it down three over five ratio. A flux of three to flux over five is, is actually much less than one, meaning under very high group five pressures, you know, so very high overpressure of arsenic. Uh, so, so there's a lot more, typically uh, 10 to 100 times more arsenic atoms landing on the surface than gallium, typically. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's true for gallium arsenide. So uh, instead of having you know both two axes, and uh, you can actually represent this by just the ratio of group three by group five. That's, that's typically how uh, people would generally make a pl figure here. And then that way you can plot something in two dimensions, I mean, in planar form, right? And then now you see you have basically, uh, uh, this is one, and above it is group three rich, and below it is group five rich. And what I'm saying is gallium arsenide would typically be growing around uh, 400, uh, 500 degrees C at you know, this would be pretty high. Uh, sorry, this would be three to five would be very low, so it'd be kind of out here. 
group five, five is much higher. Gallium nitride, on the other hand, group three to group five is just about, so that would be true for arsenides, and we'll see very soon why. Okay. Uh, so these are typically true for uh, group five elements, uh, which are heavier and are solid sources. So uh, let's just uh, look at, uh, all right, so you have nitrogen, phosphorus, arsenic, right? Antimony and so on, right? Uh, and uh, so, so, oh, sorry, what am I doing? This is group three, boron, aluminum, indium, right? Tin and so on. So uh, these are really the ones where you have what I mentioned. This is much less than one. Arsenides, phosphides. Uh, antimonides and such. And uh, for nitrides, on the other hand, uh, we, we typically are using 3 over group 5 is roughly slightly more than 1. We want it close to be stoichiometric, but slightly more than 1. So, uh, and, and, and uh, one of the major differences between this compound, you know, 3-5 uh, element in nitrogen is, uh, than the others is this is a gas right, at room temperature too. So it has uh, uh, with phosphorus, arsenic, antimony, these are solid sources. So you actually have solids inside, uh, high purity solids, but this is a gas. And it already has very high vapor pressure. And the bond energies are gallium nitrogen bond energy is actually, uh, uh, that, that's a much stronger bond. So it has uh, uh, quite a bit of higher energy than, than the others. So, so uh, during the growth, what, what, what is uh, done is uh, because your group, so you can see right away, if you're growing arsenides, you have way more arsenic than gallium. Right? Right. So the growth rate as, as to how, far, how fast this front is going to grow is going to be determined by the one that is in least supply. Right? So gallium here will control the growth rate of gallium arsenide, gallium phosphide. Yeah. So how much gallium? Basically, uh, uh, whereas in the in the nitrides, as you can see, because your uh, group five is a uh, uh, three is larger. Typically, what you'll have is a very thin layer, almost of liquid gallium floating on the surface. It's molten, it's floating, and the nitrogen atoms land, diffuse into, for, through that, and then they form the bond. So the nitrogen is what controls. The group five is what controls the growth rate here. If you have this situation, uh, that's pretty clear, right? I mean, if, uh, depending upon the supply here. So, uh, uh, and the growth is really also a competition between uh, between a dissociation. Basically, you are sitting at a temperature. So, uh, as an example, so gallium nitride, uh, uh, this. Um, the, you, you, if you are at, uh, let's say, this is 700 C. Uh, go to 800 C, and let's say a little lower, 400, or 500 C, right? Uh, so I'm looking at gallium nitride. So what you'll see is as you grow, if you grow at 700 C, uh, and you change, you do say 10 growths, okay? Uh, one with a very nitrogen-rich growth, and one is closer, and then one is stoichiometric. One has more gallium a little more gallium, and, and, and so on. You can do 10 of those growths, okay? And then you take the sample out and look at it, and what we see is uh, there is actually a window of temperatures, uh, window of temperatures, and so you take out the sample and you'll look at it with your eyes, and you'll see there is, uh, well, okay, so if you are here, you're growing under very gallium-rich conditions, take out the sample and you'll see droplets of gallium on the surface. It will be left over. Right? And I think you can see why. Basically, there will be uh, uh, too much. There's too much gallium, right? And it couldn't incorporate because the nitrogen supply was fixed, and, and it, everything that's left over is now left over on the surface. It, 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 but that means during the growth, it was I mean, it was floating on the surface, uh, the excess gallium. And after growth, instead of a thin layer, because you cooled it down, it basically contracted and formed these droplets. You know? uh, the surface tension and all kicked in, and it cooled down. You know? So, uh, and then you grow, uh, look at others, and then you'll see there's a little window in which the surface is extremely smooth and there are no gallium droplets. You know. Actually, even, even if there are gallium droplets, they're very tiny. Essentially, it goes down, and, and then w there's a small window, typically, where there are no gallium droplets and it's very smooth surface, at atomically smooth. You see atomic steps there. Right? And then the nitrogen-rich conditions, you'll see that it's 
there are no droplets, but then there are big pits in it. You know? so, so the surface, uh, so here, the surface morphology is basically you're seeing atomic steps, very, sh very smooth and atomic steps. Here, you are also seeing atomic steps, and, you know, but then you see these big blobs of you know, gallium sitting there on the top. And it's not a problem. Typically, you can remove the gallium, but you don't want to go too far in a gallium-rich regime. So, so this is kind of this nice window to grow the material. And then here, what you see is there are these atomic steps, but then there'll be you know, these V sort of defects where there's atoms missing and, 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 and so on. It, it depends, right? So, so the surface would be rough. Uh, under, under those conditions. So, uh, so, so this basically, uh, and then you can go back and do another experiment at 500C and 800C, and what you'll see is there's, there'll be some sort of a growth, you know, it's not really uh, uh, technically a phase diagram, but something like that. What you'll see is there's a window like this, okay, uh, in which uh, below, uh, below this flux, so within this window you can get pretty smooth and, and, and nice, uh, uh, you know, high quality low defect density gallium nitride, and outside of that, there's something going bad here or something going bad there. And, and, and this window is generally going to be work, work out okay. And you can do actually much more careful studies and people, st you know, these things keep evolving, you know, and then some, some groups will find, well, actually there's a little bit of space here where you can get also good growth if you modulate the beam or do something else like that. And so, so there are all these tricks to play. Yeah, yeah. But, but that's the general strategy. So you do the same thing with gallium arsenide. There'll be a window under which you grow very high quality gallium arsenide and indium phosphide and, and so on. So, but you see, the, the, in the end, the, the range of things you vary are really very few. Fluxes and temperatures. That's really what, in, in epitaxial growth. This is not bulk crystal growth, by the way. This is, you're, you're depositing on, on, on a substrate already. So, so it's not bulk crystal growth. Okay, so uh, what we'll uh, discuss now, uh, any questions? I mean, I'm just telling you some, uh, uh, some get, getting with some orders of magnitude and, and numbers just to, to, just to uh, look at this. And uh, so, so for example, the growth rates typically uh, by uh, MBE, I told you the temperatures would be, you know, seven, 800 C. Uh, uh, as you climb up in the periodic table, this is another trend. I think you realize that the bonds get stronger uh, these are strong solids, so you typically have to grow hotter, so high, higher temperature growth. So it's necessary for it to, you know, for move to move atoms to to make them, you know, uh, uh, make it smooth or or or, or have higher quality, uh, and uh, uh, and and therefore, so so typically, if you're growing indium antimonide, it's a very low growth temperature compared to indium arsenide, indium nitride, and so on. So, so as you go up, the temperatures at which you want to grow increase. The growth rates are typically determined by the fluxes and also slightly the temperature, but more so the fluxes. And growth rates by this sort of physical vapor division, MBE, can range, depends, I mean, depends on how you want to grow it, uh, micron an hour to, you can go up to 10, I mean, 10 is a very high number, but you can, you can grow, change the growth rates by almost two, two orders of magnitude, 0.1 micron an hour, that's 100 nanometer, per R2, uh, and you can grow at these rates, but typically you have, uh, uh, if you are growing quantum well structures, quantum dot structures, near the active regions where all this, you know, you want very sharp interfaces and all that, you typically slow the growth down, and you can do that. You can start out fast, grow the layers which are buffers and all that much faster, then when you come to the layers where you have the active region for quantum, you know, say LEDs or lasers or, or a hemp, you slow down this and then go back up if you need to again. You know? so, so, uh, so, so these are typical growth rates. And then, uh, so this may not, okay, so you can convert it into, into uh, how many monolayers per second. You know? and, and it would be off the order of a monolayer a second, off the order. So you're controlling, growing one monolayer of atoms or unit cell roughly, okay, uh, half of a unit cell in a second. So that's the slowest end of the spectrum. And you can grow obviously much faster than that. So, yeah. uh, as opposed to this, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, 10 micron an hour is very fast. I mean, typically, uh, you, for active regions, you don't want to go there. You know, I mean, active regions, you're going far away. Bulk crystal growth, when you are growing bigger crystals, not epitaxy, is much faster than this. There, we are talking 50 to 100 microns an hour. 100 micron is 0.1 millimeter, and so you start, you know, 
um, so it's faster, right? Uh, the bulk crystal growth, uh, because then you basically are pulling bowls of bigger crystals. Here, it's all for the device. The devices typically need, you know, about a micron max of to make a device typically, right? Uh, make a LED or a hemp. Solar cells require more, depending upon the band gap of semiconductors. So, so anyway, okay. <clears throat> all right, so. Uh, what I want to do, uh, any questions here? I think just some general trends and such things. Right? Uh, the one thing I'll mention about chemical vapor deposition is typically the temperatures under which you do CVD growth, like MOCVD sort of growth, metal organic chemical are higher. And the reason they're higher is because you have to make sure that that chemical reaction goes to completion. It's a chemical reaction, just as a, you know, uh, for example, for growth of gallium arsenide, or let's say gallium nitride again. Uh, you will have a substrate just like that, and uh, uh, the chemical vapor deposition, the major differences from the physical vapor deposition is, is you have a, a gas source. Uh, typically, if you want to grow gallium nitride, let's say you have gallium, and it's called trimethyl gallium. Right? What does it mean? It means gallium atom doesn't come in as a solid source. It comes in with a methyl group, so CH. H, H, right? So that's one methyl group, right? uh, methyl group. And there are three of those. I think you know gallium is in group three. It wants to form three bonds. And the three bonds it forms are, sorry, to uh, trimethyl gallium. These are metal. I think you can uh, see very clearly why it would be called a metal organic, right? Gallium is a metal. And this, these three are organic ligands that are attached to it, right? So, so, so it comes in. And then nitrogen comes in typically as ammonia, right? H, H. Right? Be, uh, so uh, as ammonia, and so these two come in, they land on the substrate. Right? And then uh, the reaction, I think you see what you want is really this gallium to form with that and everything else to leave. Right? So that's what you want in the gallium nitride growth, right? And so the reaction really is exactly that. You'll have Gallium and you know CH3 3 plus NH3, and you get gallium nitride plus CH4, which is methane, and that has to escape. You have to get it out, right? So, okay. Three times that, right? And and so on. I mean, you can have other sources. Uh, uh, aluminum will have something like that, and dopants, and all that. All those things come in like that. And this chemical reaction, I think you know from reaction kinetics and such, is uh, it has you need a certain sweet spot in temperature to, for this to occur. And typically, those temperatures for uh, nitrides are of the order maybe about 1100. I think this may be a little bit on the higher side, but roughly like that compared to about six or 700 C for MBE. You need a little bit higher temperatures here. And uh, because uh, the substrate temperature is higher, uh, so because you have gas sources, uh, and these are, uh, the pressures here are very far from ultra vacuum. This is kind of closer to atmospheric pressure, closer to atmospheric pressure, which is why it generally is very hard to track the growth, because you can't do electron beam diffraction here, right? Electrons will get scattered by those molecules before they can reach the surface. So, so it gets harder because of the higher pressure to do these in situ diagnostic tools that you can kind of do nicely in a physical vapor deposition technique. But the advantages of these are high temperatures also lead to lower defect densities and uh, reasonably good growth rates. But depends. I mean, uh, both techniques are used. Uh, this is uh, typically uh, uh, considered to be a little easier to scale to larger wafers, you know, this is, uh, uh, chemistry. Uh, versus uh, this is uh, uh, considered to be, uh, but both are used. You know, gallium arsenide, for example, a lot of the cell phones in your pockets today have, you know, the amplifiers are grown by MBE, in, 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 and, and uh, uh, a lot of the gallium nitride LEDs are grown more by MOCVD. Uh, some of the highest performance transistors with gallium nitride are still grown by MBE, and, and so on. It depends. And so both can be to engineered to do. Right? So that's a generic. CVD idea, you need a chemical reaction, typically at a higher temperature. And there, again, you are controlling the flow rates of these two and the temperature and the overpressure or the background pressure. That Those things are the ones you're controlling here, too. It's very similar to that. Right? OK, so let's now uh, discuss uh, about uh, uh, you know, how does the chemical react, or rather, how, how, does the how do the bonds form 
how do you, how do you control? I already mentioned this temperature is a big big knob for controlling things, and then we'll now see uh, uh, some of the energetics of this, and then you know how, how do reactions or how do these uh, um, uh, reactions really give you the exact crystals that you want. Okay, so, so this is uh, again I'm I'm looking at chapter four. Uh, so I went to chapter eleven just to pick up a few of these growth techniques, but chapter four again uh, of of uh, rocket uh, where. Uh, this is basically talking about phases and phase transitions. Okay, so and I think you have, uh, again, um, you may have uh, seen this, but we'll talk it talk about it from the perspective of uh, of, of this problem that we are talking about of growth. Okay, so uh, so so in growth, uh, I, as you can see that uh, I mentioned, if I'm growing here, uh, what I'll get is you know I'll get a crystal of GAN here, but then there'll be these big droplets of gallium. Right? So there are, uh, there are clearly two distinct species of materials there. Right? One is, is gallium nitride. It's homogeneous inside. You can go in and look at a window here, window there, window there. It's all gallium nitride. So it's uniform. Right? Similarly, you can go in with a window here, and you'll see these are all gallium atoms. Right? So that, but they're distinct. Right? So, so there are really two species here. Right? Uh, in, in, in that situation, uh, right? Uh, here it's only one, uh, and similarly here it's only one, but there you have two species, right? Uh, so something has changed, right, from one layer to another, and what, has, what is that change thing? And, and that's what is mathematically at least would be called a phase, right? A phase is a chemically and structurally homogeneous material. Chemically and structurally, it's not just one or the other, right? Uh, what does that mean? Well, um, uh, is, uh, so, so clearly this is chemically a homogeneous material because all the atoms are gallium, right? It's chemically a homogeneous material. Similarly, this is chemically a homogeneous material because all the, you know, every window I look at has 50% gallium, 50% nitrogen, right? exactly equal. Right? So that's, uh, but what about this window? That's not a phase, right? Because this is not the same as that. It's not a phase. Right? So we want to make it more precise, this notion of a phase. Uh, not only that, structurally too. Right? So maybe I did something, you know, not very, uh, I did, did not a very good growth, and this window of gallium nitride is wartzite, and maybe for whatever reason, here I have zinc blend or cubic. Right? Maybe right? I did something, and this is what ended up being. So then that I won't consider to be one phase. Now this is one phase, this is a separate phase. Even though it's 50-50 gallium and nitrogen, but it's a separate phase because the structure is not homogeneous. Structurally, lattice structure is different now. Right? So, so that's another phase as well. Right? So these are the different phases. And uh, uh, what, what I'll do is uh, I'll first talk about some of the energetics. And in the next class, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, why, why did I, why are we trying to distinguish different phases here? Okay, so, <clears throat> all right. So what we'll do now is, is uh, 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 try to discuss that uh, uh, with, with this notion of, a, uh, of something that is structurally and chemically the same is defined as a phase. What, what we really want to answer today for the rest of the class is uh, what is it that drives a system from going from one phase to another? That's really what I want to answer right now. And this is a very generic notion, just like we covered you know, scattering as a very generic notion. You can apply to many sorts of scattering problems. Similarly, this is a theory, or rather the idea, the generic idea is that of a phase transition. So how do you go from one phase to another? What is it? What are the knobs you have? And how do you ensure you get what you need? You know, I mean, basically, if you have a knowledge of which way the phases will go, uh, that is going to help you to grow what you need to, to get get what you need, right? So, uh, so the uh, what what we want to kind of start with is is look at the notion of uh, so 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 uh, a phase uh, I, 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 as you also uh, know that that uh, for example, uh, let's say I have uh, a single phase material, single phase material, so everybody's the same phase. And I'm doing something to it that is 
trying to force it to go to another phase, now, doing something to it, changing the temperature or doing something to it. Okay. So now, how does this transition occur? Because we said that, uh, so here's phase A and here's phase B and I'm doing something to go from say uh, uh, phase A to phase B where this may be, I don't know, word side, this may be cubic, maybe, right? or something like that. Right? So oh, I'm, I'm driving this and very rarely does a phase transition occur where this is very abrupt and you know it, it goes you know the whole thing from A to B very rarely what most of the time pretty much majority of the time will occur is there will be boundaries that will be formed inside region A it's a gradual change what does it mean there will be boundaries formed inside A where it will be A most of the region, but there will be a very sharp boundary inside which it becomes B. You will nucleate a region, right? And then becomes, and then these things grow, right? These boundaries, right, uh, will grow, right? And then, then at the, you end up with that. And then they may merge, so there will be another boundary here, another boundary there, and then they may merge there, right? Exactly, I mean, this notion is not very difficult to grasp, I think, right? So. And I, I think you have seen a lot of these transitions. Maybe you can give me an example of, this is not necessarily just about chemical phase transition. A, a lot of phase transitions occur this way, right? Maybe you can give me some examples of something that d goes through this process. Formation. Yeah, formation of ice from water. That's, that's clearly one of these. And what else would be, even you know, from basic electronic or magnetic properties, you would see this phase transition, right? So, so. So for example, you take a, a magnet, right, and you start heating it, right, a magnet which is poled in one side, and, and then you have, you know, all these will be upspins, and then small regions will start flipping downspins, right? And then uh, you end up with a phase in the end where basically you, you can see it's a very interesting, you, you end up from a ferromagnet to, to a paramagnet or something, which is to say even microscopically, at the atomic level, it's still spin ups and spin downs, but you know, uh, there, there is uh, you cannot distinguish every region. You look at it now as it. similarly ferroelectrics, right? Will go through this sort of transition, right? Those are the order parameters are charge and spin there, right? But we are looking at chemistry as well. We are looking at crystal structure here as well. Yeah, so, so uh, what I want to kind of start with now is is look at uh, th this sort of a phase transition and how do we approach this problem, how do we kind of uh, uh, build a mathematical model that will tell us, tell us which way things are going to go, right? And this is a very interesting uh, uh, question which uh, there are basically two schools of thought, right? One school of thought says that, we, well, we already know that what atoms are making up this crystal, okay? So what atoms are making this crystal, maybe let's say A's, or rather, let's say small A's and small B's. So this crystal is made of gallium nitride. No, A is gallium, B is nitrogen. I know all the quantum mechanics of all these atoms. I know the electrons. I can do the quantum mechanics of all these atoms, right? And I solve the whole energetics of the big, big block here, right? energetics of it, under the boundary condition of the temperature you're giving me or whatever you're giving me, whatever you're changing. Right? As a function of that, I'm going to solve the whole system and then try to so find out, as a function of temperature, what happens as, as you change the problem. Right? So that problem is a microscopic problem, which says it, what is, uh, I don't know, I mean, this approach would be called a reductionist approach, meaning, uh, reductionist approach meaning uh, uh, you're solving the problem in an ab initio format, right? Ab initio format is starting from the, you know, most fundamental building blocks, uh, equations we know, which are basically, you know, say quantum theory uh, of which, uh, and then uh, uh, apply all the laws of physics to, uh, you know, see, would, to tell you which direction are things going to go. That's a reductionist approach to this problem, uh, or ab initio approach. The other approach, which is very interesting, is, uh, uh, is a, uh, at least started out earlier because people knew that you could do this, you know, since the development of quantum mechanics in 20s and 30s. At that time, it was numerically impossible to solve it because you didn't have those powerful computational tools at your disposal, which is why this was not possible at that time. Now, it is starting to become possible, but even now, you know, you can solve it for small systems, not big, big systems, right? Uh, the, the computational tools are not there yet, but it's getting better and better, right? 
The other approach which has been very successful is uh, what's called emergent approach, you know, where, where what you do is, look, you're basically going to say, say in the beginning, I'm, comp I'm going to be completely oblivious of the fact that this thing is even made of atoms. I don't care right now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to basically uh, excite it by some means. I'm going to maybe use a hammer, strike it, and see what, what, how does it respond. How does the system respond to some perturbations I'm going to apply to it? Okay. I'm going to heat it, I'm going to do something like that, you squeeze, apply pressure, uh, or add some more stuff to it, and then see what happened to the system, you know, where did it end up. Right? And by looking at these you know, various snapshots of this, I can reconstruct the physics that's going on inside. So that's called an emergent approach, uh, meaning you are really oblivious to the microscopic models of this picture. You don't even at some point care that there are atoms inside. You know? So, so, so that's an emergent approach. We are going to first look at this, and I can just point out later how do one do a reductionist approach. A reductionist approach is very simple to write. You can write it down in four equations. Essentially, solve the Schrodinger equation, apply the partition function, you know, and then it will tell you the probability of every possible state after that. That's it. Right? There's nothing else to do after that, right? But the problem is numerically intractable, typically. I mean, that's the challenge, typically. Right? This, is, uh, this is what we're going to look at now, because you can actually... Uh, 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 okay, so we're going to look at the emergent approach, or uh, sometimes variously called, I don't know, mean field, or, or, or all kinds of approaches like that. And, and this sort of philosophy goes across many other things. I mean, you're looking at not just uh, thermodynamic phase transitions, or you know, phase transitions of this nature, but many other things. Okay, so yeah. so uh, uh, what we are going to do now is, is uh, say that, look, the whole system, what am I going to change? Uh, I can change the temperature of this, of this crystal, right? As, as you saw, we have a very few things we can change, right? Can change the temperature of the substrate. I can change the pressure of the background in the MB system. I can tweak my pumps and all that and change the pressure, all right? And I, uh, what I'm changing continuously is the number of atomic species that's landing on this system here, right? So that we are kind of looking at this semiconductor box here. You know, this is our system right now. So those are three things we are changing. Okay. And what we are going to track is how, do, how does the total energy of that box change with these three parameters. This is the number of atoms that's landing from outside. This is the pressure uh, and the volume of this object. Right? And this is the temperature and we'll see now, naturally it will ask us the question, what is the entropy and all that, we, we, we'll see now. Okay? Yeah. So we're looking at the total energy of the system by looking at the three variables we are changing. Does that make sense? That, that, that's really what we're going to do now. Right? And uh, so the total energy of the system, uh, 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 again, uh, okay, so, so uh, we're going to write, let me write it, the change in the energy because, you know, it's a dynamic process. The change in the energy is, is, is because of uh, various things. Uh, uh, you have change because of your thermocouple that's heating the substrate. So that's basically, we're going to call it, and this is, uh, you know, the most confusing term most of the times is heat. We're going to just call it heat. And it has to do with entropy and randomness. And we're going to talk about that. So this is the heat term. Uh, and, and then we are going to add to it the work. You know, so these are the words I think you, you know have come from classical thermodynamics. Heat, work, right? What is work? To me, work is you apply a force and move a certain thing by a certain distance, right? What is work? Well, the change in work is force times distance. Very simple. Uh, you multiply this by area, divide by area, you get pressure times the volume, right? This is, right? Force per unit area is the pressure. Land, atoms are landing there, right? So this is PdV. So uh, that will be our work, right? And, uh, and then every atom that's coming in, you know, gallium atom coming in at, uh, you know, uh, elevated temperature, start at elevated temperature, it comes in here, that's how many atoms are coming in is N, Ni. How much energy is it bringing with it is mu. How many electron volts is it bringing with it is mu. Right? So that's the, energy, that's the increase in energy because of, 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 of this uh, work, uh, sorry, of, of this uh, chemical uh, species. And you can have, when I sum it over I, I think you can see very clearly I have gallium is I is equal to 1. Arsenic is I is equal to two, all kinds of species, just add them up, right? So that's the total stuff that's landing on the surface, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, 
you can call it a chemical energy. And you can see that uh, from this uh, emergent picture, you can have many other energies. You can keep adding to that. You can have gravitational energy. You can have nuclear energy. You can have all these other things. Right? So typically, in these chemical reactions, most of the energies, I mean, I think you can really see that gravitational energy is very weak. You know, unless you are in some deep black hole or something, the energy is very weak. right? So we can forget about that. Uh, uh, then you will have nuclear energy, but in, these are chemical reactions. We are not doing nuclear reactions in this. I mean, the temperature scales and all are not touching those windows. But if you were, you can add them in there, right? So that's the idea here, right? You know. so, so these are typically where we end, and then you can have more, but we're not adding them, right? Because in the typical epitaxy process, this is what I'm interested in most of the time. And, and uh, for the heat, uh, uh, we are going to look at this in a little more detail. Uh, work, I think we just said it's minus P times dV, uh, I, mu I, and D and I. And heat really, uh, the, uh, you know, you probably have full semester courses on heat, but uh, understanding heat, but heat and entropy are very deeply in, in intricately related, right? Heat is, is, is uh, manifested as, 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 as a, uh, 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 well, okay, so what I'll, I'll just write here is, uh, temperature times change in the entropy, T times dS. That's all I'm going to write. Uh, we can obviously discuss this in great detail, but I think uh, uh, this should be something that you may have seen many times, but I'll, I'll just maybe say a few words. Okay. Temperature in Kelvin, dS, right? and S is the entropy. Right? And uh, entropy is uh, very often I think still, you know, people are trying to figure out what it means. You know? so, so it's a measure of disorder, right? And Boltzmann gave us a precise definition of entropy. He said that entropy is a constant, which is the Boltzmann constant, right, times the natural log of how many configurations the system is allowed to have without changing its energy, without changing anything else. Right. What are the, how many possibilities are there for the system to be at the same state? Right. 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 So that's really the, the definition of entropy. Uh, and, and in a way, uh, if you convert that to energy, the constant in that ratio, conversion of entropy to energy is temperature. That's the meaning of temperature. Right. So, so the, it's a measure of disorder in some sense. Right. So it's higher. Uh, so, uh, so, so this is... Uh, uh, is that clear? I mean, this is something you, you probably have seen, and uh, um, if it's very clear, you can write papers on it, because I think people are still trying to figure out what it means. Right? So, uh, but this, uh, this information is actually very interesting, because it started out from thermodynamics, and now the concept of entropy in late 40s uh, created the whole field of communications. You know, when Shannon took the same idea and applied it, Cloud Shannon, and applied it to information theory, right? And, and, uh, and then say that you know the the amount of entropy or it's related to noise uh, going through a signal you know through optical fiber or when you make a phone call how much noise and how much so it's also related to that right so and now it's emerging the what uh, the idea is emerging is entropy is actually a far more general concept than just thermodynamic phase transitions I mean then so, so quite quite a bit more yeah. uh, and now uh, the latest thing if you know, you're interested in physics and quantum theory is, is, is basically uh, you have entanglement and there's entropy related to entanglement of, of states. And it's very interesting. And then some of these emerging new materials like topological insulators have some weird sort of entanglement entropies that were not seen before. So people are still trying to figure out what, 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 what does this mean. Right? So, yeah. But uh, for us, uh, the entropy is exactly what I wrote. And, and uh, what we'll do now is yeah, this this seems a little. Uh, if it seems, uh, I mean, you, you have again probably seen it, but uh, there are three terms: heat, work, and chemical energy. Uh, uh, and now you can kind of have various combinations of these. Various scientists have come along and said, "Well, this combination of these four terms is the most important thing for this set of reactions." You know, and then it goes after them. Something is called, so, so everything is energy here, right? So if you take, for example, uh, uh, if you take uh, you know, the pressure volume term, the work term, and add it to energy, E here, if you take this here, right, and you have basically TDS plus this left, that's called the Helmholtz free energy. Because Helmholtz said, that, well, for my sort of things, this is the most important term. Uh, maybe I'm not changing the volume of my crystal at all. Right? 
right, right? So dv is zero. So in that case, this is, or, or I'm doing, and similarly, Gibbs comes along and says, well, if you also are exchanging particles and other things, and you're not changing temperature pressures, then Gibbs free energy is basically you take both of these things here. Just that is the Gibbs free energy. Right? Just, yeah. And uh, irrespective of what what what's the name for for any particular energy, uh, so uh, uh, this would be. Uh, Okay, so sorry, I, I think, so this is called the enthalpy. This is the Helmholtz free energy, and this is the Gibbs free energy, right? So, uh, and I think I, I, right away you see that if you are, if your number of atoms, or the volume of atoms is changing, the number and the species, then you should be looking, and Gibbs free energy is an important parameter for you. And if you go back, and you know, early part of the course we're doing Fermi levels of a semiconductor, you know, and why should electrons flow from here to there, a PN diode, it's actually the same thing. We're basically, electrons are trying to minimize the energy they're flowing, and the Gibbs free energy is is what uh, makes sure the reason why Fermi level has to be the same everywhere at equilibrium is because the Gibbs free energy is minimized under that condition and things like that. Because it's the same deal. But now we're looking at atomic species, uh, and, and 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 what I want to do is in the last uh, you know whatever time left is left today is to essentially use this to explain. The question I asked in the beginning, let, let's say I'm trying to grow indium gallium nitride. How do I make sure that I have a homogeneous single phase indium gallium nitride and I don't have two phases, one is indium rich, the other is gallium rich, or I, I don't have indium nitride and gallium nitride completely phase separated. Using this, you can say it in a very nice way. So, so, so. And then that, uh, again, if you have uh, taken such courses, you would know uh, what I'm going to do probably, but uh, uh, okay. So let's say we are growing indium gallium nitride. This is again from your uh, book, and, and what we are going to do now is, or f any alloy, silicon germanium, right? Silicon germanium may be a simpler system to talk about because there are only two atoms, right? So you have only two atoms, uh, uh, and let's say I have phase A and phase B, and I'm trying to mix them now. I'm trying to mix them. And what I want in the end is exactly, and this is basically one of the very important things you want to do in compound semiconductors, I want an alloy which has exactly x composition of A and 1 minus x of B. It could be indium nitride and GAN, indium arsenide, or silicon germanium, whatever it be, germanium tin. And I think you know why I want it to be exact, because all my band gaps, if you make a quantum well, the band gap, all those things depend on the exact composition of this, right? You have the the electronic properties, photonic properties, they all depend on this, right, X. So I want it to be homogeneous and exact, right? You don't want any phase separations and all that sort of thing. So how do I get that, right? Uh, that's the question. And, 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 and so now uh, you can see the problem here will be, uh, uh, the, essentially the problem is posed in the following way. Uh, I have, all right, I have uh, lattice sites where these atoms A and B can go, right? Uh, let's say I have A atom here, right? And uh, what we are saying uh, is, is uh, so, so, well, you have, we have one situation where everything is A. Right? That's phase A, right? One situation where everything is B, that's phase B. But what I want in the end is I have A, B, and then maybe again A and A. So, so let's say I have 10% A, uh, sorry, uh, I, I want 0 0.9, B 0 0.1. Let's say that's what I want. So one out of ten should be B, right? And 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 then so I can kind of try to uh, uh, go that way. And I, I think you can see that you you will now need uh, bonding. And so if I look at this window, it should be t roughly one out of ten should be B. If I go to another window here, one out of so so it should be homogeneous. That's what we call as a single phase alloy. XB, right? Every window is used. So you can see your window cannot be one atomic side. Then you cannot have it, right? It has to be a certain scale of window here. Right? So, so that, that's understood at least, yeah. So, uh, so what are the energies involved here? Because what we're going to do is we're going to apply this and answer the question, what do you need to do to get that, to get this alloy homogeneous single phase A AX B1 minus X? Right? And, 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 and that part we can answer by saying, we first uh, uh, ask the question, well, let's say we have N sites here. You know, N sites, very large number, but and sites here, and uh, uh, we have uh, chemical bonds. What are the possible chemical bonds? Well, we can have a bonding between A and A, right? So that will have certain energy. Let's call it, you know, H bar omega AA. That's the energy scale of that, right? Uh, we can have BB, 
and we can have AB. Right? That's the, the three, three kinds of bonds that can exist. And A, B. So, right? Three energy scales in this problem. And uh, I think you can kind of see that I'm, I'm, I'm kind of uh, going to sweep some things under the rug. For example, if there's an A here, this chemical bond, it's bonded to many other things too, right? It's in a typical, so, so the others can also influence it, but let's keep it simple right now and just say this, these are the three. There are some other nearest, next nearest neighbor and all the other things like that that can picture in this picture, but I'm not considering them, make it simple enough right now, okay? So, so there are three energy scales here and, 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 and the point is we are starting with uh, n, big n number of sites and we want you know, essentially, uh, uh, one, one, you know, this percentage of B atoms in there. So, uh, let's see. So, so, so uh, w one of the things you can probably see right away is uh, the questions you can ask and answer right away is what is the energy uh, uh, lowering? What is the lowering of the energy? But, or rather, what is the change? We don't know lowering or increasing right now. What is the change in the energy if you had two separate crystals where this was, you know, the size of this crystal was 0 0.9, and this was 0 0.1, and this was B, and this was A, right? You can ask that question. How, what is the, so that's, that's a completely phase-separated system now, right? Uh, two separate, right? So it has a certain energy. And this alloy has certain energies. What's the difference? Right? So we are looking at the difference of the two energy scales now. So I think you will you'll realize there that uh, 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 from here you can basically uh, look at uh, AB. Right? So uh, if I have, uh, I'm going to write down an energy scale. What is that energy scale? If I had two of these bonds, minus one of this, minus one of these. The, uh, that's the energy scale that's driving everything here. Right? the difference of these two bond energies minus i think the h bar is just to you know normalize as you can see so h bar bb that's a very characteristic energy scale that is going to answer a lot of questions in this problem okay and uh, i think in your book it's called the zeta or something like that this is just an energy scale right? <clears throat> okay so now uh, uh, if you mix it right and you have x of uh, these atoms uh, or A's and 1 minus X is B. Let me write this down first and then we uh, make sure that we, we understand what it is, okay? So, so what we are uh, looking at at this point is, is, is uh, uh, all right. So what would be, uh, I think the symbol used in your book for whatever reason is this Xi, okay? Uh, is, is it says that uh, it's this energy scale times X times 1 minus X is, uh, uh, he adds a two here for whatever reason. So let me just, so, so you have the energy scale, but then once you form the alloy, I think you might have seen this many times, x times one minus x is, it tells you, uh, uh, so this is the, essentially the, the total change in energy because of formation, this versus that. So this is the total change in energy. As you can see, if x is zero, then you know, there is, uh, uh, you, you, you have the completely phase separated situation, right? or x is equal to one, it's complete phase. There's no, no mixing, there's no alloy, right? X is zero is binary. Oh, sorry. It's pretty clear what I mean here, hopefully, right? So, so is, you have not mixed anything here, right? So it's separate. Right? There are two phases. Right? X is zero means two phases, x is one it means there are two phases, right? Now we're looking at a single phase system here. And, 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 and if this is the uh, energy change uh, because of, of uh, uh, the formation of these chemical bonds, uh, is that all that I need to answer this question? Is what is the change in energy uh, because of the system? The answer is no, because that is basically, you know, all these other terms. Let's forget the volume for a second. It's this term, effectively. This we haven't considered yet, you know, because uh, do you see what I mean? So we have looked at other terms, but we have not looked at this yet. So this part is another term of energy that can be required or that is released because of this mixing, right? and that's the entropy term. Right? And the entropy term has to be added to that in order to answer the total question is what is the total change of energy. So this is not, not all. That's the point we're trying to make. So what is the entropy term? Now the entropy term uh, is, is, is basically you have big N sites out of which 
let's say there are n a atoms of a right and n b atoms of b and the total is big n right? that's what we're going to fit into that you know lattice right the total is equal to that and therefore i think you can see very clearly from here that x is obviously n a over big n and 1 minus x is n b over big n right so that part is clear right and n is a big number, right? And so are NA and NB, right? So, so they're big numbers. And uh, what, what does Boltzmann say? It says that the entropy of this whole thing, of this whole, forming this whole crystal, is Boltzmann constant times natural log of all the possible configurations in which you can fit NA A atoms into this lattice and NB B atoms into this lattice. All possible, right? right? And how many configurations there are is basically it's a combinatorics problem. If you have, you know, big n sites, right, uh, and and you have a of one kind, n a of one kind, and and b of one the other kind, I think the answer uh, is, uh, I think you know, is n a plus n b factorial, right, divided by n a factorial n b factorial. That's that's the answer. Right? That's the how many configurations you have, right? right? So that's your uh, that's your entropy for this whole crystal, forming the one single phase alloy. Is that clear? And then from here, uh, what you do is, is you realize that, uh, uh, you know, these are big numbers, so uh, you can use all kinds of nice approximations. Natural log of a very big number, m factorial, is uh, m natural log of m, right? This is a Sterling approximation. There's a minus and all that. We can forget about all those other things. So, uh, uh, so, so that basically just becomes very factorial. Let me just write that down. Minus natural log of A factorial, natural log of NB factorial. So, so that's your total entropy of the whole system. And then you take your Stirling approximation, and then it becomes, let me write that down. This becomes basically n natural log of n, right? n v, yeah. Uh, and what I'm going to do is, there is an n here, so I'm going to pull that out, right? I'm going to write that, right? And uh, uh, this becomes n a natural log of n a, this becomes n b natural log of nb, but I pulled out this n, so I divide, oh, what did I do here? Sorry, I, I pull out the n in the numerator, so I divide by n, divide by n, right? Right, so, so that's fine. And I realize that this thing is basically na over n is just x, which is the alloy composition I'm after, right? So this is just x, and what you can do here is divide by n and multiply by n, right? Right, so so I can write this quantity now as natural log of x minus x natural log of n. That's what it becomes. And similarly, this one becomes 1 minus x natural log of 1 minus x minus natural log of n. And that's what it's all going to become, right? And you can do all these cancellations. What you'll see is you know, this thing, this thing, and this thing will just go away. The big numbers will just go away, right? And then what you end up with is, is the expression for entropy, KBN, natural log. And this is basically a very important result for alloys in general, plus 1 minus x, natural log of 1 minus x. Right? So that's the entropy because of the mixing of the two uh, kinds. And, and, uh, and, and basically from here, uh, uh, what you get is the total change in the energy is basically this and this together. So let me write that down. Yeah, so I'm looking at this term now. Uh, the total change in energy is basically, you know, whatever is the xi. It's T times S. Okay. So this is the total, not the differential anymore, but the total. So what you do is basically multiply by T here, and I'm going to basically uh, normalize everything. To, so this is normalized to single atom, per atom, per unit atom. So what you have is basically, in the end, 
you have two terms. One is this term that looks like a characteristic energy times x times 1 minus x. I'm forgetting about all these twos and all that. The other is looking like kt times x natural log of x min uh, plus 1 minus x natural log of 1 minus x. That's, those are the two terms that are going to go against each other now, right? So what we'll see is entropy is always going to increase as you increase the temperature, sorry, as you increase the temperature, this thing is going to increase, right? And just to be careful, uh, what do I mean by that? Natural log of x is negative, x is less than 1, right? Uh, it's negative, and this is also negative, so this is basically a term that's kind of going down, right? And this is a term that's is positive, so essentially, uh, let me pl show you the plot of this, and this is actually exactly what is shown here, right? The plot here, that uh, one of the energies is independent of temperature, the other energy scales, the chemical energy of, you know, is, this is independent temperature, the entropy term is temperature dependent. And as you increase the temperature, this energy will start dictating. This term is going to dictate whether you have a single phase, whether you have two phases, whether, you know, what happens to it. This will, this will dictate. This temperature will be the key. And, and uh, 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 so, so essentially uh, what I want to show is, is uh, uh, because of, I just, you know, you can plot it uh, directly. Uh, so so here's, here's an expression that I'm, I'm comparing the two energies. Uh, at t is equal to zero, the entropy term is zero, right? It's, it's kT times the, all these natural logs. And, and this is basically your bond energy that I wrote here, the difference in the bond energies. And then as you increase the temperature, uh, you can see the entropy term. So I'm taking the difference of the two. You know, the entropy is, is a neg minus Ts. This is positive, this is negative, this is minus Ts. So, so as you increase the temperature, uh, the difference is, is basically the green, okay? And then as you increase the temperature, at some point you see, you know, here and here it has already crossed. You know, the entropy term has increased. And therefore, you start getting into the negative energy. So this is total energy, and the system wants to be wherever is the lowest energy. Okay? If your temperature is zero and you're trying to grow this crystal at zero, zero degree Kelvin, you will have A and B separately. You will not have any alloy mixing. Okay, so that's the whole point. And as I increase the temperature, for example, here, I will have an alloy of this composition and of this composition. I will not have what I desire. Does that make sense? I mean, so, so I'll have some with maybe 5% of A, and some regions are 5% of A and 95% of B. Some other regions have 95% of A and 5% of B. That's not a single phase anymore. It's two phases, and you know, so, right? So this is two phases, and then you'll reach a critical temperature over which this thing will actually switch and become just one minima, right? And that's when you have basically now you have 50/50, for example. Right? Does that make sense? That's really the game. And then uh, B here is is the energy scale of of this problem. Uh, you know, whatever is the bond energy, and you can see the temperature and the bond energy are intricately related. Clearly, from this equation, you know, those are the two things that you are controlling, right? Uh, and and this is really the origin of the phase diagram, right? When you see the, all these phase diagrams, what are we talking about? Well, it's it's uh, the you know, as you start from zero degrees C in temperature, you have two separate phases. Right? As you increase the temperature, now I have, you know, I also have two separate phases, but these phases are different compositions. Now they're moving in, right? And then above a certain critical temperature, you have only one phase left now. Right? So, so this is basically the locus of these lines merge at 400 C and at or 300 something C, and so you have. These are the phase boundaries between the two. Okay, good. So I think we are a little bit over, over time, but please read this from your book, and, uh, uh, and I'll give you a, a couple of problems in your next assignment just to make sure that we map it to our problem of semiconductors here. Yeah. All right, thank you.